Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. Today I've got a fascinating uh, safety roundtable to share with you with my guest Björn Jepsen and we talk all about neuroscience safety. Now I'm not going to try and explain that to you because Björn will do a much much better job than that but suffice it to say the conversation was really interesting and it's all about how the brain works and how we can leverage the understanding of that to overcome the safety plateau. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's get into it with myself, Björn, and uh, as always on the Safety Roundtable, a number of other people joining in with the discussion as well. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week, we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints, and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms, and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Okay, welcome everybody to today's Safety Roundtable. Um, just checking everything is working okay. It looks like it is, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, everything seems to be working, which is a, a bonus. Um, so okay, well, thank you. Oh, well, you can hear me on my phone. <laughs> um, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for joining uh, today's session. Uh, I'm letting people into the Zoom as we go, and I'll be monitoring the chat for uh, interactions, questions, insights, thoughts. Uh, on this really fascinating topic, which is all about neuroscience safety. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Björn, who's going to uh, talk us through this topic. But quickly, before we go into it, just an overview of what the Safety Roundtable is. So it's a fortnightly Zoom meeting, and uh, it is live and interactive, hence being a roundtable. So we really love when people join us on the Zoom. You can watch it as a, as a live stream and join in the comments, but the best experience is to come and join us on the Zoom. We cover a different topic every time. Um, either I'll talk about something and then open it up, or like today, I'll have a conversation with somebody bringing some insights and something fresh and uh, new and innovative and exciting to the group, and then we'll open it up to a discussion. So um, do get involved. Uh, if you're not on Zoom, Get involved in uh, in the chat and the likes and the comments so we know you're here and having fun and enjoying it and send us through uh, questions and there will be uh, plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So uh, with that being said, um, welcome uh, Björn to uh, the roundtable today. Do you want to just give a quick overview of your sort of background and who you are and what you do? Sure. All right. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation and thanks to everyone who have actually decided to invest uh, an hour of their time uh, spent together with me and Chris that's absolutely amazing so uh, my background and coming into neuroscience safety is maybe a bit different than most other people but right now I run a smaller company together with our chief psychologist, he's called Jens Hardy Sørensen. We started our collaboration, uh, I think, five years ago from the grounds that we were so curious on finding out a way for how people could actually go more safely to work from a psychological point of view. Mm -hmm. And if you're in doubt, and maybe I'm stumbling over the words, but I am from Denmark, so it is my second language. So I, I apologize if I need to. You are uh, our second Danish uh, uh, guest in a matter of in a matter of uh, months, actually, because we had uh, a guy on uh, Jasper who talked about um, sustainability recently as well. Ah, that's amazing. All right, so you are aware of the accent. So one of the things that fascinates me the most. And this is one of the things is diving straight into it because I think that whenever people started hearing about neuroscience safety, they kind of thought that we were coming into taking over and trying to tell everyone that they have been doing everything wrong up to this point of view. 
but that's not how I see it at all. We actually see it as an extension of where people are right now. I find the statistics to be immensely fascinating. That is just so clear to see that there is a plateau that, that doesn't mean that what have been done is, is bad or in any way uh, could have been done differently. It just means that it's time to actually start viewing it in a different way. And you need to stop me because otherwise I'll just keep on talking because this is something that is quite... Uh, I'll, I'll pass in occasionally, don't worry. All right. Cool I, I, I'm with you because I I always talk about the, the safety plateau as well in, in my area of slips. So it's definitely a topic I'm, I'm, I'm keen on. Yeah. And, and I think that it is, it is important that we start by accepting that this is where we have come to. And, and then we need to kind of work from there. And one of the things that, that also fascinates me a lot is whenever it is that we're interviewing uh, great HSC people, on my own podcast, which is called uh, something like HSC Mental Focus, uh, where we're trying to just figure out what journey have a very experienced HSC professional been on? Can we kind of uh, see that there have been some sort of evolution? And what's quite clear is that most people have a lot of experience. So it's very hard to find someone who just have two years of experience within safety. Most people have 10, 15, 20, or 30 years within this field. And they're very, very skilled at what they do. So what's fascinating here is that when they have that extended period of experience, what they try to do in the beginning, they try to come up with the perfect policy, the perfect procedure, they re-edited it, they did a lot of root cause analysis, and then they, they tried to formulate it so that it was, it was perfect until they had to kind of realize, all right, so this is not going to work in the long run. And they kind of came to the conclusion, okay, so maybe people are always going to make mistakes. Maybe we have to take that into consideration. And then they have started to investigate in uh, behavioral safety. How can we actually interact that? How can we take that into consideration? And one of the people that we have trained and, and are working with currently, who, who puts very great words, wording into the difference between uh, behavioral safety and neuroscience safety. So behavioral safety is where we kind of look at people in groups and we look upon how they're actually behaving. And then we try to transform that into a way. We try to teach them about bad behavior where the neuroscience safety is much more about looking upon, okay, so from a very low practical point of view, how can we take this very complex topic of how the brain is actually operating, how the brain is generating thoughts, and, and how can we take that and compress that into something that's extremely simple so that it can become part of the everyday conversation not just whenever you're having a safety moment, but actually being part of how people are acting on an everyday basis. And I'm more than happy to, to share concrete examples of, of how that can actually be done. But what I think is, is tremendously interesting is that we can take these very experienced HSC professionals who have done all sorts of trainings, and then we give them just a small nudge. And now they suddenly have a whole new way of actually viewing and analyzing, but also going backwards and seeing, okay, so we have now seen the same thing over and over again. Now we have a whole whole new set of tools that can actually change that so that we can just analyze it and come up with a way of interacting with people so that they will change their behavior to just be more safe. Hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. And uh, one of my questions was going was gonna to be, what's the difference between neuroscience safety and behavioral based safety so i think you've kind of answered that um <clears throat> but are we saying that then the, the neuroscience is more about the individual rather than you know the the herd should we say the herd mentality coming into play this is more about what individuals are doing themselves and the and the choices and decisions and thoughts that they're having um as opposed to, to, to in a group setting that's one part of it so that it's definitely going away from kind of the one size fits all to kind of taking it into a more individual approach. 
but I'll try to explain it using a sports analogy because one of the clearest things, and if you haven't seen it yet, I can highly recommend to go see the Netflix series. Uh, what is it called? Where with the um, with the Formula One drivers, Drive to Survive. Drive to Survive, yeah. Because this is an excellent analogy of where we are kind of at in the HSC evolution right now. Because you can see these drivers, right? They have been doing, uh, they have been driving go karts from a very young age, going into bigger classes. The very skilled ones of them went into Formula Two, and then there are these twenty lucky guys who gets to drive Formula One each and every year, and. What's clear if you follow this series is that obviously they do a lot of practice in the car. They have done tremendous amount of hours behind the steering wheel in all sorts of different setups. They also do physical training. So they actually work out. So they're physically prepared to, to take on the challenge. But what is also crystally clear is that they all have a strategy for how to set themselves up mentally to be most likely to actually succeed when it is to coming when when sorry when race day is coming and this is quite important because if we combine that or compare that to what has been going on in in HSC from a historic point of view is that if we just teach them the policies and procedures one more time there is a high likelihood that they will do it on and follow it the next time Whereas we need to draw upon this example and say, okay, so if the best in the world actually need to prepare themselves mentally before they go into, in quotation, battle or into driving a race, we need to actually, we need to ex get in inspiration from that and try to, okay, so how can I actually, intro I can, how can I put this into a, a policy and procedure? How can I make sure that people are actually mentally present before they're about to do something dangerous? or they're going to do something that involves a lot of people, how can we actually ensure that people are mentally prepared? And this is part of it as well, so that we're actually getting to teach people how to be mentally present when they're about to do something. Mm -hmm. Because when you take back to kind of the sports example, it's quite clear when they're not there mentally. Obviously, the car can break down. But otherwise, there are kind of three outcomes of a normal Formula race, race, right? So either they crash and have to exit the race, or they crash, hurt themselves, and potentially also other people. And then as a third, if they're mentally there, everything goes their way, they, they actually win the race. So if they're not winning the race, there is some clear consequences where we can see it. So there is also and inspiration coming from kind of the sports world. And I know, and this is something that I, I think the, the interpretation of how we can take the science and make it into something that's extremely simple also applies here. Because whenever we're looking upon and drawing upon examples from people who come from the sports world, they always have a steep peak whenever it is that they actually need to perform. So a let's just stick to the Formula One driver, but it, it's the same for footballers or whatever sport it is that you're into. There's always kind of a peak. This is the moment where you need to be peak performing. So a Formula One driver, he needs to perform at the qualification on Sunday and Saturday and on Sunday, whenever it's race day. Now we need to drop on those experience and how it is that they're setting themselves up mentally. But we also need to actually acknowledge that People don't work in peaks. So some people work in various peaks where, okay, I need to be mentally present when I'm doing this lift or whatever it could be. But for the vast majority of us, we actually just work in, in smaller waves where it's not like, okay, now I need to be performing for the next 30 minutes uh, here and there. But it's much more about just having a state of mind for that particular situation that you're in and this is also part of it translating that and trying to transfer that into something that's actually usable for people who are trying to keep uh, people safe so you again using the sports analogy and if you think about training uh, mm -hmm. in sports um one of the things that i know lots of very successful 
sales trainers would say, for example, is that you need to be doing role playing of sales conversations because you can't just go into battle to use the term you used um, unprepared. You've got to be uh, doing as much prep and getting your your mind in the right space uh, to do that as possible. So is that the sort of thing that, you know, as a consequence, things like role playing um, are, are some of the practical steps that we could go take away and, and work on? So the the role playing is is can definitely be used but i think that and and the, the termination of role playing so when, whenever you say role playing coming with that example i see uh, the people on sales called getting hit by objections and they're kind of i get the feeling that someone is calling me and i'm trying to get off the phone right and I think that just to switch the mindset a bit, we need to do role playing, but much more to an extent where we're trying to get people to visualize what is it that you need to be doing to be acting out safe. So what is it that you actually, what steps are you doing? So imagine having a safety moment where you ask everyone to close their eyes and then say, okay, now I'm going to walk you through it. Okay, so I walk over to Peter. Then I do this thing together with people, with Peter. And then Peter, Peter, what do you do next? And then they can kind of walk themselves through it because that actually gives us an, an opportunity to, to change if people are, are thinking to do something that is not going to have a great outcome or we can train them to do something differently. And referring back to the sports analogy and especially to the Formula One drivers. And this is also a technique that they're actually using because uh, you can find fascinating YouTube videos of these Formula One drivers visualizing a track days before they actually need to drive it. And the best of them, they can actually hit it. The, they can do a visualization lap of that particular course where they're hitting it within seconds of what they will do. They can explain what gear they're in, in, in every turn. And, and you should try to check it out whenever the session is over. But that's just to tell you that, or to demonstrate that if we actually allow people, either individual or in groups, to have a chance to visualize what it is that's about to happen, there is a higher likelihood that we can go in and train on safe behavior. So that's quite fascinating in all modesty. And the great part about it is that our brain can't really tell the difference if we have actually done it or we have just visualized it. And a huge part of that is also how we can work with, from a very low practical point of view, with the safety complacency. Because if we continuously train people in doing the right way, the right way also when they're just visualizing it, it gives another way of having a, a, a dialogue with them both before and after something occurred, an incident. Yeah, I, I like that. And um, I, I should have used the word visualization because that's kind of what I had in mind a little bit when the sporting analogy, I was thinking of golf, for example, where you, you know, you stand over the shot and you kind of visualize exactly how you want to shape the shot and where you want it to land and where it's going to run and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely with you on that. And that's a really powerful thing. Uh, to do. Interesting point you raised there about the brain not understanding the difference between visualization and actually doing something. And it's it's really interesting um, around how we can sort of trick the brain, isn't it, into, into thinking different things. So, for, for example, if you think about um, somebody famous, let's say the queen, uh, the queen, you know, passed away and the vast, vast majority of us have never met her and probably never even been anywhere near her in our lives. But we all kind of feel like we we knew her in some way, shape or form because we've seen her on the TV and we've listened to her and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, it's very interesting how you can have this um, effect on, on the mind that, it, that reality isn't necessarily what you see as the truth. And that is such a strong analogy. I'm going to take that and steal it because that's... <laughs> That's something that everyone can actually relate to. And, and that's, that links straight into something that I call the, the new enemy of HSC. Like the new enemy of safety is this awareness of what's going on. And 
a huge part of that, and this links straight back to what you just said, right? A huge part of this is obviously how much time we're spending on our smartphones, not just this niceness of being on social media and interacting there, but also the amount of emails that we're answering, the amount of text, the amount of notifications that we're getting in. Now, again, linking back to this, this analogy of our brain not being able to determine, did I do it or did I just imagine it? If you're getting 50 to 100 emails per day, it's going to be hard for your brain to actually remember, did I actually answer that or did I not? And this is something that's so complex. And this is one of the fascinating things about what we're actually, the, the huge study that we're doing right now, everyone has a group uh, on how this is, how our new behavior is affecting uh, the brain. And a huge part of that is this thing that if you go on any social media platform right now, and maybe you're not there, but I can assure you that there are a lot of people in your organization that are, and they're getting exposed to something that's so fast changing. So the images, the small videos that they're seeing, and they're getting exposed to bits and pieces here and there. And again, the brain can't determine if they have actually been on that white beats or not. But when they turn off the phone and they look, oh, I have to get back to work. That's pretty boring. And now I'm just too fatigued to actually make the right decision. And we can, we can end on how that fatigue can actually be in, explained right now because there's been kind of a breakthrough uh, in, in the science uh, specifically on dopamine, which is ridiculously fascinating, especially if you actually want to create better results uh, in HSE in the long run. Sorry, please. <laughs> no, that's good. And you, you were telling me about the dopamine uh, research and you, you've got uh, some videos or something that people can watch. We'll, we'll put those links into the show notes of this and we'll pop it on the on the stuff. Do you want to just give us a quick overview of, of that? So the, the quick, the really quick overview of, of that is that the, the storyline of understanding dopamine were that when it was first discovered, it was heavily linked to addiction. So alcohol, drugs, smoking, a cigarette, this was kind of where it was all linked. And they, the, the, the intent for the scientists were that in the beginning, you would only get the release if you actually got it. So in the understanding of I am walking down the street, I see an old friend of mine and I get a hug and we explore all stories. It releases a huge amount of dopamine, right? So that was kind of, they, they thought that the, the physical thing had to happen. So either meeting a friend, smoking cigarettes or whatever it could be that releases dopamine. Now what social media especially have actually, uh, what's um, social media have actually shown us is that you also release dopamine without actually doing the thing you can just have the expectation of getting it and it is especially now that maybe happened a couple of a uh, couple of years ago maybe 10 15 years ago what has happened now is that we've gotten an uh, even further in that understanding of how that is exactly happening and it's a 25 minute video. So I'm not going to go into super many details on this, but it is quite fascinating because it's literally understanding this and applying this to your own work. But also if you can apply this understanding to the people that you're working closely with, it is literally the Holy grail of uh, motivation because it goes in waves. And what's fascinating is that you need to understand in a way that you actually need the wave, the dopamine wave to be moving because if it's not moving, you're not going to do any kind of initiative. And there is also a historic pattern there that can be linked to the rewardness of actually doing something right. So if I'm doing a safe behavior, then I should get a fulfillment. But if I'm just doing safety complacency, I'm not. And if there's not a link in the history of releasing dopamine for doing the right thing, then it's just going to decline and the motivation for doing the right thing is just going to fall off the cliff. That's in very short terms. <laughs> a bit like um, tr training a, a dog to um, to sit in exchange for a treat and then eventually they, yeah, the, the mind sort of, they just think they're going to get that uh, hit of dopamine 
uh, if that's the right word for dogs. I don't know whether dogs have dopamine, but uh, by by doing the right thing, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, very, very interesting. So um, we'll, we'll link that video there. And you've done a lot of <clears throat> uh, videos which um, people can find on, on, your, on your LinkedIn and your website and stuff. Um, in terms of, um, there's quite a few questions coming through, which we'll get to uh, in a few minutes. But I just wondered, um, for people that kind of can see uh, the, the the piece about the plateau and can buy into the fact that actually there's this new horizon of of what we could do to address that uh, working through um, neuroscience safety what what would be some of the kind of low-hanging fruit I guess that people could go away with and, and start doing some stuff on now um, without obviously having your your level of of understanding so I I think that it's It's being curious on what's going to work for you. And a huge part of this is understanding that it's not enough just to say, pay more attention or be sure that you have the right amount of attention in this particular moment. We need to figure out a way that we can train people so that at least some of the people have an understanding of seeing, identifying, okay, now someone is actually having an impulse behavior. Now they're not being considerate to the procedure that we would normally see them do. And we need to figure out a way to do this and to explain this without it being, in quotation, too touchy-feely. Because as soon as it's about well-being or how the brain is operating, it there is a high likelihood that we can lose a lot of these people. So it needs to be almost mechanically. So if you do this, it will have this effect on your brain. And that's why the neuroscience safety is so fascinating to actually link it towards this. Because this gives us an opportunity to kind of explain it pretty straightforward. You did this because of X, Z, and Y. And a part of those is... Diving in, a, a, a great way to start would be to start interesting your, your or getting curious on impulse control, just as an example. Just figuring out why is it people that have a poor in controls and a good impulse control and starting to training that on yourself. So how can I actually start by increasing my own impulse control and then figuring out from that experience, how can I incorporate that into the everyday life of the people that i'm trying to send home safe yeah i mean yeah use yourself as a guinea pig it's always a good uh, always a good idea um uh if you are on the zoom and you want to ask uh, there are i can see there's been questions in the chat um and you want to ask a beyond a question just go to reactions and raise your hand and in a minute i'll start calling people up um beyond uh before we go to some other questions um other than obviously, you know, we we've got a, a a room here full of safety professionals who who really passionately care about um, reducing the number of accidents and injuries um, happening. Um, but I assume that taking this approach uh, to neuroscience safety, there, there's going to be some other benefits as well. Could you just speak a little bit to that? Yes. So one of the things that we see that that is an an issue is to create that that buy-in and specifically the management buy-in and having the right understanding of how the brain is actually operating. And this doesn't mean that you have to read all the, I'm not going to call them stupid, but all the difficult books that I have to go through to get the understanding. We need to take it down so that you know, as a HSE professional, now I need to figure out how is it that I can get these people on board to what it is that I'm saying. And that is not saying the same thing again as you did last week and the week before. You need to transform the way that you are addressing things and understanding this perspective of how the brain operates, the neuroplasticity, and going in different directions of how you can uh, attach and address a particular problem. Understanding that and understanding the neuroscience behind how you actually make a decision and linking back to the dopamine, taking some of the referrals there and then using that, it's just going to transform or at least that's what we're hearing from the people that we're training. It's transforming the way that they can address an issue to the management team, but also how they can get the involvement of the people that they're working with. 
and that's a topic I'm very passionate about because I, I think um, wh one of my opinions about that missing link between you know the safety plateau and where we want to be is that point about engaging with these other stakeholders and getting them to, getting their buy-in to what we need them to do um, and 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 um, so anything to me that can help with that is is hugely valuable uh, as a skill set for everybody that is um, is joining us on this on this call. Definitely. And, and if I must, if, if I can add just one point to that, because we're working with some extremely talented people in the in the States, especially who have a lot to do with insurance. And these people can obviously go in and they just look at the data, right? And then they go backwards and they say, okay, so we had an incident here or an accident. And then they go backwards to see where's the policy and procedure in place. Do we actually have the right amount here. Is that correctly set up? And in vast, in, in almost every case, those are done perfectly or almost to near perfection. So what's what's the reason for something that actually happened? It was just someone who had who wasn't paying attention to that particular situation. And then how is it that we can transform that? And that's that's a huge part of it, as I see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it's um it's also thinking about um ha having a good critical eye as well on all the other controls and making sure that they are you know because i think there's sometimes people are quick to rush to blame somebody for a human error when perhaps if you took a step back and looked at things a bit more critically you might feel as if yeah perhaps we could have done a little bit more on some of our engineering controls and, and things like that um, as well so i think um all of these things require a, a balanced kind of approach don't they and I, but i think looking at this in this kind of scientific way and opening up the possibility of uh understanding how the brain works and so on and, and how we're thinking perhaps that will actually open a few, few people's eyes as well that actually you know maybe we should be reviewing some of these other things too i agree with you because it it's historically speaking it's just easy. It's kind of an, a garbage can to just throw it in to say, okay, it's just a human error. It probably won't happen again. But it's a little bit cheap with the understanding that we have now. We need to dive into this direction and actually see, all right, is there something that we can actually do to prevent that in the near coming future? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, okay, cool. So let's start with some some other questions, and then I might have some more uh, as we go as well. Um, Tamara, you've raised your hand. Would you like to uh, unmute and, and say hello? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Good. My camera's not working right now, so I apologize for that. That's okay. Um, it must be very early in the morning for you as well. Yeah. So I hear a lot of people that are talking about looking at um, near misses or accidents, incidents that have happened, right? So we're going at the back end after something has occurred. And, you know, I've, I, I'm just curious because of our education and everything, you know, talking about eliminating and mitigating, about looking at the front end and and using you know like situational awareness observation etc with our workforce in in um tandem to be identifying potentials and getting them involved in that way right and re kind of constructing the the brain way of thinking that if we are all looking for um, risks and hazards to identify, then as a team, we could be being proactive. What about that kind of thinking? Is it realistic to get to get your team's kind of thinking in that genre to be proactive? So... Thank you so much for the question. I, I will try to answer it to the best of my ability. And then if it's not the right, then just please do let me know. Uh, so the, the quick way of answering it is yes. It, it's extremely not easy, but simple to educate people on all levels of the organization 
to a degree where they can actually go in and have a self-reflection on, okay, so what am I actually bringing to work? But also giving them a language where they can ask each other without actually thinking that, okay, if I ask this guy who looks pretty grumpy today, he's probably going to snap at me or something else. But having a, a way of actually having a dialogue with this person and to the extent where the way that our brain operates can become something that is a little bit funny because if you get the right understanding and you can kind of forgive yourself for how it actually operates, then it's something that can be uh, done with a light conversation. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Did that answer your question? Most of it, yes. And I noticed okay. that Liam has his hand up. So just, just one thing to also to add to that is that when, I think also one thing to think about is um, placement of conversations, right? I was in a, a, a discussion the other day and somebody is like saying, oh, well, you know, you can just go up to the team and talk to people. And then somebody else was talking about how somebody had actually searched them out in the parking lot as they were getting into their car because they didn't want to talk about something in front of the rest of the team. So I think there's also, you know, a need for us to step back as professionals and be observant about are people anxious even when they're around? Because sometimes there's hidden body language that can identify something's going on that people don't feel comfortable right there and then to disclose. So how can we build trust and create those opportunities for people to come and chat that may not be right in front of the workforce setting? That is a, a great question and it links very much back to structure. So structuring it away so that it doesn't necessarily have to happen in the parking lot, but it can happen in on different settings. But again, linking linking back to the the practical understanding of the brain. So why is it that the person doesn't want to get exposed in front of other people? And when we have that understanding, then it's easier to create an environment where they feel safe enough to speak up maybe not in front of the whole group as a beginning, but it can be then transformed into something that doesn't have, have to happen in the parking lot. I hope that makes sense to you. Thanks, uh, Bjorn and, and Samara. I think that, that question of trust is, is interesting as well, because as, as Samara was asking that question, it made me think, actually, I wonder if there's also an angle here around, you know, if we're sort of trying to um, get inside people's heads and influence them a bit, and is that going to raise some trust issues um, so we need to consider that in terms of being kind of open and transparent about if we're going to start taking this approach, you know, why are we doing it and what's in it for that person? And, and we're not trying to trick them for want of a better term. Definitely. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, Liam, you put your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, this has got the juices flowing, absolutely. Great session so far. I mean, I'll stick to the question that I, I put in the chat. Um, but really, it's about, you touched on the difference between behavioural safety and neuroscience safety. We've done a lot of work in our organisation around behavioural safety and focusing on unsafe facts and unsafe conditions. And we use that terminology terminology as well within our accident investigations. Um, and we've been able to put practical programs training programs in place for behavioral safety over the last couple of years and that's matured and got more intelligent and you know more interactive with um, the workforce but from a question that i'll put in the chat what practical steps right now are you recommending or advising that organizations can take to impact this element of the safety neuroscience safety I have a, I have an idea in mind, and I and I just wanted to hear your viewpoint before I s just spill my bean, if that's okay. All right. Well, perfectly. I, I can't wait to hear how you would approach it. So, first of all, we work with in an extreme broad variety of organizations, uh, all the way from 
where they're still trying to figure out that if they lose a life when they go to work, it actually has some consequences to the very end of people who have almost zero accidents or incidents per year, but still wants to improve. So it's, it really, really comes down to the individual organization and where they're at at this particular moment. Because if you try to enforce this with the wrong timing uh, or in the wrong way, it can backfire uh, quite heavily if you're trying to enforce people towards a change that they're not ready for. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I think, and and to that point of the different organizations, I look at my organization as, as one beast. However, mm -hmm. within that, we have different industry sectors and within even within the sectors, we have sites that are at completely different maturity levels in terms of their practical, uh, you know, application of safety. Um, and one of the one of the trials that we've got going on at the moment, not specifically around safety, um, but it's more to get more geared towards security and security patrolling is that using VR as, as a training aid. Yep. So when security officers, for example, are doing patrolling, they would have the VR visualization of that, their training of their site through the VR. Um, and then they would be able to recognize and observe potential, you know, risks. So I was going to, um, there's an idea that we could use the VR training to do similar for safety. So they would have visualization of that location and part of their patrols, then they'd be looking for potentially wet floors or trip hazard, um, you know, stuff like that. Would, do you think that would get, in terms of the visualization, which do you think that would impact the neuroscience safety aspect to then impact behaviors afterwards? It is a really great question. And to some extent, yes, but it's the visualization is more powerful. If, if we're linking it directly to visualization, it's more powerful if they do it without the VR. So that's kind of a low practical point to it, but still having the experience of have, of have walked through some plants with VR gives them one more point of experience, one more point where they can actually reflect upon. I didn't see that. Why didn't I notice that to that extent? So it can help there, but I think that you also need to reflect upon it in a way. So how can I make these people more mentally prepared before they actually do this? Yeah, no, perfect point. So setting them up one step back further. That, that would be my approach, right? So actually utilizing the VR to train them. How can I set myself up mentally? How can I be ensured that everything from my impulse control, selective attention, attention span is, is on top point. I have the understanding of what's actually going on right now. I know you British people don't like it when I use the word arousal, but it is the right terminology to arousal control. So where are you actually at? How... Are you, is the adrenaline pumping or are you haven't you had enough sleep are you bored what's going on right now and that has an effect on how you're viewing that particular situation yeah no 100 percent. thanks for that i think one step on top of that is also you know for what your like you, you know your sleep patterns are like for example and i think that's the step that you was looking at there thank you very much perfect back to you you're welcome. yeah thanks uh thanks liam um uh, just a question off LinkedIn from, from Arvin. So he's saying, um, are there any surprising or counterintuitive findings from uh, neuroscience research that have implications for safety practices? So anything that perhaps you would have expected the opposite to be true? Oh, okay. So... Um... You've, you've stumped him, Arvin. Yeah, I, I think that, but it is a really great question. So, and this is part of my journey, right? So this is part of my understanding of what it requires for us to make an impact with something that's scientifically backed. And I think that this can answer the question. So one of the surprises that we had were that if we bring this into third world countries where people have 
literally no education whatsoever, we can still make an impact if we make it easy enough for them to understand that if I do A, it's going to have these consequences, but if I do B, it's going to have these consequences. And that can be taught in a way. And, and to be fairly honest, that was a surprise to me that we can have an impact there. But if the question is directly, do we have something from the science of how the brain is operating and that was proven differently in a practical scenario, then the answer is going to be no, unfortunately. <laughs> We're okay. very simple. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Um, it shows that there's a good level of science to it. Um, Gary, how are you doing? Do you want to ask a question? Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Christian. Hello, Bjorn. Nice seeing you. Great to see you again. How are you, sir? How are you, mate? You all right? Yeah, yeah. How how's, is, the... Uh, how's the football season going for oh, you? We're, we're back in the rele- uh, just above the relegation zone, but that's that's normal for me, team. So, a quick question for you, mate. Uh, well, it's two questions. So, first one, I'll ask them once at a time. What's the research around neuroscience related uh, initiatives on performance, on health and safety? Is so was there any research to say that neuroscience has had a, a, an, a, an effect on systematic improvements and performance in health and safety? Um, uh, can you please rephrase the question? I, I, I need to be specific that I understand it correctly because... Uh, okay, mate, no problems. So I'm just looking to see if there's any evidence to say that neuroscience has uh, affected an organization. So maybe a case study uh, where somebody's yeah, implemented sure. some of this stuff and they've had, the, what are the outcomes of that? Yeah. First of all, thank you for the question. It's extremely important. And this is one of the key topics for me because I, w- I want to make it clear that whenever we train HSC professionals, it's not us who's creating the results. We're mm-hmm. We're just facilitating the process that can move them in a different direction. So for me to state, which we have great cases of production organization where we're both increasing the safety results, but also the productivity of the organization after we have applied this to very professional organizations, I'm not going to take the honor for that. I'm just going to just going to state that it's great people who are just doing more. So they're just dovetailing the neuroscience safety into what they're already doing. But here we see concrete examples of productivity going up relatively high, but also the amount of incidents and accidents are are going down Mm -hmm. specifically to a, a percent where if I need to be very specific on a percent, I would need to go back and ask because I, I want to make it clear. I see myself as a coach for HSC professionals, yeah. not as someone who comes in with a checkbox exercise that's going to solve all their problems. Yeah. So I understand that that's that's great that you've got that data from a, an individual organization. But is it is the being is it being more what's the word I'm looking for? Research though, more significant right. research, but like academically, so to speak, on on the implications of neuroscience and safety. Not from our point of view. Nope. No, I'm just thinking, has, has anyone done any research on it? Or is this a major gap in research? Mm, I think personally, there is a major gap in the research. Mm-hmm. Personally, we don't have the size of organization where we can apply ourselves to involve ourselves in, in studies. Uh, and because then it also becomes, if there is a financial interest between us and the organization yeah. that we're working with. So we would have to involve ourselves with some sort of university on that degree. And we, we haven't done that so far. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Mark. Oh, hi, Bjorn. Um, I just wondered, you were talking earlier about dopamine and being, you know, linked in terms of performance. I just wondered if there's any other um, brain chemicals that you've, you've looked into that have an equal um, relationship with with performance and safety or, or what that might be? So on a chemical level, no. So it's not like we can see that there has been a breakthrough in this particular chemistry. I, I think that uh, viewing the video on dopamine is, is going to be quite revealing on, on kind of the, the storyline of that. But then to take a different molecule or a, a different 
chemical path in the brain and say, this has been a surprise. I think it's much more of the general understanding of like, either we do a bottom up uh, reaction or we do a top down reflection where we're actually taking uh, our all the knowledge and experience that we have into consideration before we do something that would be a reflection uh, from a top down instead of just doing a reaction, which is a bottom up. And right. that understanding, the combination of those two is something that is, when understood correctly, is relatively simple to understand. There is, in in from a psychological point of research point of view, or a, even a neuroscience point of view, there's not really something new on how our brains operate. But what's new here, and that's if you go in kind of the plasticity road, so this is where it becomes extremely fascinating. So if you just take two chunks of the brain, so you have the amygdala and you have uh, the hippocampus, two fairly famous areas within the brain, right? So amygdala is kind of your fear control center. It's, it's extremely fascinating how small it is and how big an impact it actually has. So if you do certain activities, you can actually shrink that area in the brain. And you can also, if you're in an environment where uh, you're having a lot of pressure for your peers or your manager or you're getting bullied or whatever it could be, this could also increase over time. And the same goes for the hippocampus. You can also make this increase over time so that you can stay focused for a longer period of time, but you can also decrease it with having a, uh, if you have like unfortunate behavior, uh, which can be just going to work in a normal workplace if you have an extreme high pace of working, there is an issue there that can affect it. Okay, right, interesting. Uh, thanks for answering that. Ironically, um, I was working uh, yesterday in the Netherlands and I met a, a Le Mans uh, driver winner called Jan Lammers. And uh, Jan was talking about that same documentary, Drive to Survive, and he highly recommends it. Um, but he also talked about skills and drills, which is kind of like, the influence and factor and and repetition and visualization, which was really interesting. So a lot of parallels of what you just said there. Yeah. And it's it it is if I understood it correct, it, it's a really important fact that you're stating there because you can't stop doing the other stuff. You can't stop training on the policies and procedures. You can't stop being curious on how you actually edit those so that it's going to have a different impact. Yeah. In the same way as the, as the driver, he can't stop practicing. He can't stop doing the physical work and just do the mental preparation because then it's not going to have the same force. But if he doesn't have that, someone else will have that and will have done the work to increase their mental capacity when they're executing the, the task of driving the car. Mm. So they will have a high likelihood of actually being in front of him. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. It does. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Good stuff. Um, I've got a question here from uh, Karen Hewitt, who's also been on the roundtable before uh, from LinkedIn. And then if anybody else has got any final questions on the Zoom, then please do go to reactions and raise your hand. Um, so Karen says, interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can neuroscience give us any guidance on coping with environmental and system factors? that might impact our safety, but are not necessarily within our control. Does that make sense? I, I think I need to have that one more time. Just <laughs> so can, sure. can, can, can neuroscience guide us in any way on coping with environmental and system factors, which impact our safety, but aren't necessarily within our control? I think that's a fairly complicated question. Yeah. Like, so it's, can I take neuroscience safety and affect something that is without my scope of work? Or, so, how can we, or, or not maybe affect it, but how can we cope with, may, I think what she maybe means is how do we cope with the fact we can't control these things and how does the neuroscience affect that? And then what can we do as a result of that? Yeah. And that is to a degree which I'm stating again and again, just having a low practical understanding of how the brain works. If you have an understanding of why it is that sometimes when you leave the office, the brain is pounding on you. Why didn't you see this? Why didn't you do a better job? 
this is something that's normal. Have a negative self-talk is extremely normal. And before you get the understanding that this is something that's just happening on autopilot and it's not you who's to be blamed, you just used your brain in the wrong way that particular day, understanding that and how to actually stopping it, that is a huge part of how you can then maintain the energy to go back to work the next day so that you can kind of leave work at work, so to speak. Yeah, no, I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, cool. So we're just coming up towards uh, the hour. So I want to start wrapping things up. Uh, just wanted to share uh, the next safety roundtable with everybody, uh, where we're going to be talking about a topic that um, perhaps is a little bit underappreciated. Uh, so it's about the risk of sound. So I think everybody's aware of the risk of noise. But actually, there are some quite significant risks around sound. So um, uh, we're going to have um, Stephen Wheatley on and he's going to talk about what this means and what we can we do about it and some of the effects of sound on um, cognitive abilities uh, when you get older and various other things as well. And some of the work that uh, uh, the, the figures uh, in this are, are actually really staggering. So um, definitely recommend uh, recommend joining that session in, in a couple of weeks. Um, one last question uh, which came through on the chat. Um, Bjorn, and then we'll sort of go into plugs and stuff. So um, just been asked, what's, what would you say is the key message to take away today, given this is a perhaps a new subject to most people? So what would you say is the sort of key, you know, the, the key slogan on the side of the bus? Um, I think that it's about realizing that the subject of the brain and the human factor in HSC is, is not dangerous. Uh, it, it needs to be applied right, whether you want to investigate or invest your time in doing this right now or later, you will have to, as I see it, at some point, you need to integrate this into your work. Good stuff. So um, it's a bit like AI. It's coming and you can't avoid it. So jump on, jump on board now and get going. Sure. Good stuff. Well, look, um, thank you very much. I think that was a really interesting session. Um, I, I'm sure that's opened a lot of eyes and you'll you'll get a lot of people coming up to you with with follow up questions. So what's the what's the best way for people to to learn more? Uh, what's the best way for people to contact you? Is it on LinkedIn? And is there anything other than the video you mentioned, anything else that you want to sort of direct people towards um, just before we wrap this up? So I, I think the, the dopamine video is a great way to start. Otherwise, I'm I'm always working on releasing new training videos and hopefully the next one will be released sometime next week. But the, but the dopamine video is a great way to start of, of understanding how we can take a complex thing from huge amount of science and apply that into the work that you're doing every day. At least starting with yourself, getting the understanding of your own motivation is a great starter. Good stuff. And um, in terms of kind of getting in touch, is LinkedIn is, is you're, you're pretty uh, active on LinkedIn, I know. So is LinkedIn a good place for people to come and contact you and, and learn more? Sure. So just uh, please link up with me on LinkedIn or reach out to me via email. You would be more than welcome. Uh, I'm happy to have any kind of conversation with you. So please. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you, Bjorn. That's been really fascinating. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, who's joined us live on the safety roundtable as well uh, and look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks for for the next one thanks a lot thank you for having me thanks for joining us on the safety and risk success podcast if you've enjoyed this episode please hit follow and do share on social media does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest even yourself if so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.